Thank you so much. I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Eventually we'll be looking at verses 1 to 15. But to begin with, I want us to read just verses 9. I'm sorry, 1 to 13. And, and to begin with, I want us to read verses 9 to 13. And um, give you a second to find that or, or for it to come up on the screen because I want you to read it with me. Uh, we don't always do it that way. We don't always do a unison. Some churches do that. Uh, some churches do a responsive reading. Uh, the pastor or whoever's doing the scripture reading will read a verse and then the congregation the second and so forth. And that's fine. Uh, I know known that to be done in many places. But that's not what we're trying to do this morning. I want you to go and do verses 9 to 13 with me this morning. Are we, are we good with that? Okay, good. Here we go. Ready? After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about your father, my father, and our father. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to come to you and call you our Heavenly Father. And Lord, right now we pray that you will help us to center our thoughts upon you, to realize that we are in your presence. And Lord, we want to hear from you this morning. So we pray for your sweet and blessed Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide and guide us into all truth and give us an understanding of that which we hear from your word. Once again, Lord, touch each heart according to their need and save the soul that needs it most. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now today is a day we've set aside uh, to obey God's command. I'm not sure that Folks who establish holidays always have that in mind, that they're going to do it to establish God's command. But they are in this case. We are. Exodus 20, 12, the Lord says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which uh, the Lord thy God giveth thee. I always like to remind people when we read that promise, because Paul reiterates that promise in Ephesians 6, and he says the first commandment with promise. The promise is what? That thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So what does that mean? It means if you honor your father and your mother, you're going to live longer. Well, how much longer? I don't know. Well, longer than what? Longer is a comparative term. Longer than you're going to live if you don't honor your father and mother. That's it's pretty simple, isn't it? Okay. So it is in keeping with the will of God that we honor fathers. Now, that's all true and it's all right, but did you ever stop and ask yourself why? What do you mean why? Why should we honor our father? Now maybe your father was a great man or is a great man and maybe your father's a great father and maybe he's done a wonderful job as being a father, but what if he hasn't? What if your father hasn't been a great father? What if your father isn't a great man? What if you don't even have much of a relationship at all with your father? Are you still supposed to honor your father? Yes. I heard Jerry Clower, he was a great storyteller. Many of his stories were, were very humorous. I heard him talk about that years ago. I can't quote him verbatim. I don't have the, the quote in front of me. But he was not happy with his father. His father was not in the home. And he was not happy with him. And, and a lady, dear friend of the family, told him, said, Jerry, you, the Bible says honor your father. It doesn't say honor your father if he does what you think he ought to do. It just says honor your father. And he said that stuck with him the rest of his life. Real simple. So we are to honor our fathers. Why? Well, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. What if, you, again, your father isn't honorable? Or what if you just don't like him? I remember many years ago seeing a movie and I don't even, I'm going to tell you the truth, I don't even remember what the movie was. I don't remember what the name of it was. I don't remember what it was all about. 
I don't remember who the main characters were. I remember one thing from that movie I saw back many years ago. Young man was walking with a young woman. They were talking, and he said to her, he said, I don't like my father. And she said to him, you don't like your father? He said, no. He said, well, you, your father, and she pointed out the good things about his father. He said, you don't understand. I love my father. I just don't like him. There's a lot of folks like that. A lot of folks like that. And, 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 and by the way, that's the only thing I remember from that movie. So don't come to me later and say, what movie? I have no idea what movie that was. I really don't. But I remember that one thing from it. So what I'm trying to get across to you is this. Why should we honor our fathers? Well, there's lots of reasons, especially if, if again, if your father's done a great job or is a good man or an honorable man. But again, what if he isn't? Why should we honor him? Well, God said so. And you know, the truth is that ought to be reason enough. That should be it. But the Lord usually doesn't give us a commandment and not give us a reason why. I, I like this. When I first went to college back in the dark ages, um, <laughs> the vice president of the college, we were in freshman orientation, and the vice president of the college had all of us together in, in the main auditorium, and there were, I don't know how many freshmen there, but it was, it was quite, a, quite a large number. And he took the student handbook and he went through the student handbook with us, and he gave every rule in the student handbook. And when he gave it, he said, this is the rule that we have. Now here's why we have this rule. And he explained to everyone, you know what? When he got finished, I had no problem with any of the rules in that handbook because there was a good reason behind each one. Does that make sense to you? I hope so. Well, you know what I'm telling you is God does that. God gives us the rules, and most of the time he tells us the reason behind it. So he's going to do that for us this morning. Jesus taught us a great deal about fathers, and I want us to consider what he taught so that we have a better understanding of why we ought to honor our fathers. So go back, stay in Matthew 6. We're, we're not going to any other chapter this morning. Go to Matthew 6 and take a look at verse 1. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. Lord Jesus, and by the way, this is right in the middle of his sermon, his famous sermon on the mount, the first public sermon he preached. And he says, take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Now stop right there. How many of you have done alms this week? Raise your hand. Yeah, I don't see a hand, but you probably, uh, there, there were two. Okay, good. It took a little while. Uh, you probably have. It's just we don't use that word much anymore. Uh, we don't talk about alms much, A-L-M-S, alms. What are alms? Well, uh, I kind of anticipated that everybody didn't have a great understanding of what that. So simply put, according to uh, C.I. Schofield, it's righteous acts. So righteous acts. What are righteous acts? Things that we ought to do. Things that we ought to do before God. Things we ought to do for people, uh, to help people. Uh, we would maybe today say charitable acts. The word charity means love, so loving acts. But righteous acts that we do. And it says, take heed, Jesus says, take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of who is it you don't have a reward from? Father. Your Father, which is in heaven. Therefore, verse 2, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now, what he's saying here was very valid in that time and place. There were people... Obviously not the majority of people, but there were people who were quite hypocritical. And if they were going to give money to the poor or help somebody in some way, they would actually blow the shofar, the trumpet, before they did it. So everybody would look and see that they were such a magnanimous person. They were doing this good thing. And the Lord is saying you don't do that for the praise of man. You don't do that to impress people. 
I've, I've long ago stopped trying to impress people. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty futile thing. Maybe there's something you do well. Maybe you have a talent. My fifth grade teacher told our class, she said, every one of you ha will have something in your life where you excel. Something, one thing, at least one thing, maybe more, or at least one thing that you do better than anybody else. And she was an honest woman and a good woman. And I believe her, and I'm still looking for mine, and I'll find it one day, too. <laughs> I'm sure I will. But I've long since stopped trying to impress people. Really have. The truth is, anything I could do well, there's somebody who can do it better. So why am I trying to impress you? No point to it. None whatsoever. So what I'm encouraging you to do is pay attention to what the Lord says here. Don't do your righteous acts. Don't do your charitable acts. Don't do your giving. Don't do good things to other people. Or don't do good things for the Lord for the attention you get. Don't say, hey, look at me. See what I'm doing? Look at this. Because the Lord says if you do that, that attention that you get, that's your reward. Don't expect when you stand before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, him to reward you for that because you, you already got your reward. You got it here and now. So in verse 3 he says, but when thou doest thine alms. Now notice how the Lord said that. When thou doest thine alms. When you do righteous acts. When you do good things. When you do charitable deeds. When you help people. When you give to people. When you serve the Lord. When you do it. He didn't say if you do it. He said when you do it. He expects you to do that. It is expected that you are going to do right. So when thou doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. In other words, you do it so that nobody has attention. And what he's saying, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That is, uh, that's just an illustration that nobody should know what you're doing. It's a figure of speech. But I can relate to that because we heard beautiful piano and organ playing today by people who do it very well. And they weren't doing it to impress you either, though I think you could have been impressed. But I, I understand it because when I sit down at the piano of the organ, my left hand definitely doesn't know what my right hand is doing. <laughs> it just, there's, there's no communication there at all. In verse 4, he says that thine alms may be in secret, and that thy father, which seeth in secret, himself shall reward thee openly. You do right because you want to do right and because you want to serve Lord and not for the glory of man, not for to impress people, not for the pat on the back or the shaking of the hand or the congratulations or the, the plaque or the trophy or whatever you think that you might get from it, the promotion or whatever you think will come from it. Don't do it for that reason. Do it for the Lord. Do it without anybody knowing what you did. I mentioned earlier offerings. Now, let, let me share something with you. I don't talk a great deal about offerings or money, period, in the pulpit, but I'm, I'm going to for a moment here. When you give an offering here in the church, uh, if you use an envelope or you write a check or you do an online gift uh, and you note who it is, we can give you a receipt at the end of the year. And you can use that for your tax return or whatever else you might want to use it for. But you'll get a receipt. One man, however, came to me. This was a few years ago. And he said, I'd like to get a receipt for my offerings that I gave during the year. It was, I think it was tax season, if I remember right. And I said, um, well, we'd be glad to do that. I said, you used an offering or you wrote a check? I said, no, I always just gave cash in the, the offering. Well, that's good. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever, but we can't give you a receipt for it because we have no idea how much you gave. Does that make sense to you? That's just practicality. We have to have some written notification if you want a receipt. It's, it's that simple. But I said that to lead up to this. Many times people do. They just put in cash in the offering, and sometimes they even put in an envelope. They put no name on it, and we don't know who gave that. By the way, that just wasn't going to go here, but I, I will just in case somebody's wondering. 
I don't generally know how much you give anyway. I'm not the one who, who tallies all that and keeps track of it. Other people do that. I, I'm not me. And so if you're thinking, oh, preacher, boy, he knows how much I'm giving. I don't. Okay. <laughs> I, I could. It's easy enough. It's in the computer. It would be easy enough for me to access, but I don't. Why? Because I don't want to be distracted by that. What do you mean? I mean, when uh, Michael over here comes in the door, I don't want to look at him and say, oh, here comes Michael. Boy, we're going to have a good offering today. <laughs> you know? I, 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 I don't want to think like that. Nor do I want to think, here comes Michael. He's a cheapskate, never gives anything. <laughs> I, I don't want to think like, folks, I'm human. I don't want to be distracted by that. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So there are other people who know whether you're a cheapskate or not, but I don't. <laughs> okay. I'm kidding, you folks. I'm kidding. Really, only God knows that because only God knows your heart and only God knows what you have and what you don't. Somebody asked me, well, I've been asked several times over the years, do all your members tithe? And I say, I don't know. And they say, you don't know? I said, no, I don't know. They said, why don't you know? I said, well, it's impossible for me to know. He said, what do you mean? Or they said, many people have said this. I said, well, for me to know if everybody was tithing, I'd have to know how much everybody makes. And then I'd have to figure out, you know, what a tithe of that. Forget it. You know, I don't know how much everybody makes. How would I know if they were tithing? Does that make sense? Okay, here's what I do know. You do what the Lord leads you to do, what the Lord lays on your heart. The Bible says every man according as he purposes in his own heart, and that's the way it should be. Now, I said all that to say this. We're talking about the alms, and the Lord sees in secret. He knows what you do and what you don't do. He knows, and he will reward you openly. Yeah, I know what you mean, preacher. When I get into heaven, he's going to give me my reward. Well, he will because he's promised to do that. But what the Lord's saying here is he may give you reward in this life openly. He may bless you. Now, I'm not saying this, and, and I'm going to move on from this, but I, I'm, I'm not saying this. One fellow told me, he says, well, if I need uh, $1,000, I give $100 in the offering. I know God will give me 1000 back. I'm not sure I'd try to follow that formula if I were you. Why not? Well, it just may not work out that way. That's not what the Lord promised. He promised to reward you, and he promised to reward you openly, and he promised not to shortchange you. But he didn't say, uh, look, you drop in 100, I'll give you a thousand. He never said that. So let's keep things in perspective, and let's do it with the motive of honoring the Lord. Then, in verse 5, he says, and when thou prayest. Again, he doesn't say if you pray. He says when you pray. He is expecting you to pray. And that's so important. That's so important. And honestly, folks, I'm not telling you this to be, try to sound ultra spiritual to you or anything of that sort, but when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is pray. Why? Why? Because my memory is only about that long. And if I don't pray first thing, I'll forget. <laughs> it's just that plain and simple. So I do it to get it done and make sure I don't forget later in the day. So the, the, the Lord says, when thou prayest, not if you pray, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now the Lord is saying this. He just, he's not telling you don't pray. He's saying do pray. And he's not telling you you can't pray publicly. You can pray publicly. He's saying don't make a big show out of it. And he says uh, don't be like the hypocrites when they pray standing in the synagogue or on the street corner corner of the street stand there and pray out loud in front of everybody now can you do that you sure can you sure can and sometimes it works well uh, but not the way he's talking about the Lord's talking about here somebody who's going to stand on the street corner or in the synagogue and hold up their hands and shout out loud and 
so that everybody sees and knows that they're praying, so everybody's going to say, what a spiritual person that is. Did people ever do that in Jesus' day? Well, apparently they did. Not only does he make reference to it here, but he told a story about it. He said two men went to the temple to pray. One was a publican, and the other was a Pharisee. And he said the Pharisee lifted up his voice and prayed and said, Thank you, Lord, that I am not like other men. Thank you, Lord, that I'm better than other men. And certainly not like that publican over there. Well, I'm sure better than him. The publican won't even lift up his eyes, the Lord said, smotes his breast and says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Sincere prayer for the heart, a humble prayer from the heart, is what the Lord was commending there. Not a prideful prayer. Now, praying in public doesn't have to be prideful. We pray in public here quite a bit, and, and it's, the Lord's not saying you can't pray in public. I'm going to tell you one, uh, one time a story that happened years ago when I was in school up in Chattanooga. We had a, a fellow student there, and he was studying for the ministry, as, as many of us were. And I, I'm sorry, after all these years, I do not remember this fellow's real name. Uh, because we called him by his nickname. Uh, he had a real name, I'm sure, but I've forgotten it. His first name was Jerry. I, I don't remember at all what his last name was. But he was always, and, and not in a prideful way, but he was always praising the Lord. And so we just got to call him Praise the Lord Jerry. You know, he, he, he praised the Lord so much, we just called him Praise the Lord Jerry. So one day, Praise the Lord Jerry was in a supermarket, <coughs> And I don't know what prompted this man to do this, but a man got angry with him. I don't know what made the man angry, but he got angry with him, and he said to praise the Lord Jerry, not knowing that he was praise the Lord Jerry, you understand. But he said to him, in harsher words than this, but he said to him, I'm going to beat you up. And like I say, he, I said it nicer than he did, but he said that. You get the idea. And Jerry said this, he said, that's fine, but before you do, let's pray. And he knelt down in the supermarket there and just started praying. And what did the other guy do? He just turned and walked away. <laughs> now, was it okay for him to pray in public? Yeah, you better believe it. <laughs> Probably the best thing he could have done. Don't you think so? Yeah, I'll never forget that. So the thing is, it's not wrong to pray in public. It's wrong to do it in a prideful manner, to draw attention to yourself, to try to promote yourself. That's what our Lord is saying. So in verse 5 again, he says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret. And the Father which seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. Now I ask you again, who is it that's going to reward you? Father. father. Whose father? Your father. Your father. That's what he said. Your father is going to reward you openly. And then he says in verse 7, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. And what does that mean? What he's talking about, and he says the heathen, that is the uh, idol worshipers of that day, would pray just chanting the same phrase over and over and over and over. And why did they do that? Well, he tells us, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. In other words, just by the volume of words, you say the same ten words or eight words or whatever it is, you say those same words over and over and over, and if you say it enough times, your deity is bound to hear you. Think about the contest 
Elijah had with the prophets of Baal. And they called out to Baal all night. And they cut themselves and they threw themselves on the altar and so forth. And, and there was no answer. Elijah prays a simple one sentence prayer. And God heard him. That's the kind of thing the Lord's talking about here. It's not the volume of your prayer as, as far as the number of words that you pray that matters. It's not the volume of your prayer as far as how loud you pray that matters. I, I had a man say to me one time, said we lived in that area where it was possible to do what he was, he was telling me. He says, if we pray in here, our prayers will get no higher than the ceiling. We got to go up there on the mountaintop and pray so God will hear us. You don't. And if you had to, we'd be in trouble around here best thing you could do would be go down to the trash dump and that's about the highest place around here so I, I don't know if you want to have prayer meeting there or not but uh, I, I may not join you I, I trust you'll understand when you pray pray from the heart that's what the Lord is saying and the Lord's going to hear you and it's not for your multitude of words. It's not for any show that you put on. The Lord's going to hear you when you pray from the heart. Now, what he's telling us here is not only teaching about our conduct and what's right and wrong for us, but he's also teaching us that our father, your father, and my father, and our father rewards us. Now, I do need to share one thing with you. He is not everyone's father. I've shared this here many times. There's a, I, I like Christmas songs, I, I do, and I realize it's June, not December, but I like Christmas songs. And I, I like especially the ones that are really about the Christmas message, but I like some of the ones that aren't so much about the Christmas message. They're just, you know, kind of the happy songs of the season. And are there any you don't like? Sure. And it's like I'm sure there's some you don't like. But there's one that uh, I liked a lot when I was younger, and then I get to listen to it as I got older, and I thought, yeah, well, I don't know if I like that one as much. The song is called Here Comes Santa Claus. How many of you know that one? Okay, a lot of you do. Okay. There's a line in that song that says this. Santa knows we're all God's children, and that makes everything right. That sounds good. Sounds good, doesn't it? The problem is... It's not true. Well, I know it's not true, preacher, because there's no Santa Claus and all that. Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay? I'm not arguing that point with you, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the line that says we're all God's children. It doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 10 and in the book of 1 John, both places, it tells us not everybody is a child of God. Only those are God's children who have been born again. So if you want to be the child of God, you need to be born again. So when the Lord is talking here, is he saying that these are people who believe in him, the ones he's talking to? Well, apparently that is what he's saying. So are you saying that, that God doesn't answer the prayers of people who are not born again? Let, let me share something with you about that, and I think I'm on solid biblical ground here. Our God is so gracious, I think sometimes he even answers the prayers of unbelievers. But you need to understand, he had never promised to do that. Therefore, he has no obligation whatsoever to answer the prayer of an unbeliever. With one exception. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Other than that, he hasn't promised to answer the prayers of unbelievers. But he is so gracious that I think sometimes he does. Now, why would he do that? Well, maybe to draw people to himself. Had you thought of that? Yeah. But the Bible also says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, who's saying that? A believer. Also, the Bible says in Isaiah, your sins have separated between you and your God so that he will not hear so the sin barrier separates us from God now thank God that 
In 1947, uh, Chuck Yeager flew a jet plane for the first time faster than the speed of sound, and it created what was called a sonic boom, and they said he broke the sound barrier. I, I read the other day they're going to start using again. They had them years ago, and they stopped using them because they said they were too expensive to operate. They're going to start again uh, supersonic airliners. I just read that in the last week or two. But... Man has broken the sound barrier. But at Calvary, on the cross, Jesus broke the sin barrier. That barrier that separates us from our God. And when we come to the Lord in prayer, when we come, we as believers come to the Lord in prayer, when we come to the Lord in prayer, we come as his children. And he hears us because he is your father and my father and our father. So with all that preparation, let's look at the model prayer that the Lord gave us. Now, he says this, be ye therefore, be, I'm sorry, be not ye therefore like unto them. Who's them? The hypocrites, the heathen, be not like unto them. The hypocrites are not the heathen, they're two different groups. The hypocrites are the people who claim to know God and, and are hypocritical about it. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Now, isn't that great? God already knows what you need before you ask. So why do you need to ask if he already knows what you need? Why didn't he just give it to you? Because he wants you to ask. Now, why does he want you to ask? Well, I think there are many reasons. He loves you and he wants to hear from you. And he knows that many people, if they didn't ask him for anything, he'd never hear from them. <laughs> because sometimes that's the only way reason people talk to God is to ask him for something now that's true uh, it shouldn't be true it shouldn't be true in your life I heard people say you know I come to you today Lord not to ask for anything but to thank you well that's, that's right and that's as it should be and he's going to teach us that in just a moment but he says your heavenly Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. But the motive of your prayer should be to honor your Father. The motive of your doing good things should be to honor your Father. But when you pray, he knows what you need. Just waiting on you to ask. So he says, after this manner, therefore pray ye. Now, quite often, and it's very traditional to call this passage the Lord's Prayer. One day, and, and I, I told this story once here before, and, and the fellow sitting here didn't like it. Didn't like the way I told it. He said, well, it's not what you should have done. And may, maybe he's right. But I'm not going to tell you what I should have done. I'll tell you what I did. I was asked to have prayer at the opening prayer at the city commission meeting here in town and I was asked in years ago a number of times to do that and then they stopped asking but uh, <clears throat> point is I was asked and they said you know we'd like you to have the opening prayer for the city commission meeting but uh, reverend and, and nobody who knows me well calls me that but he said they said reverend could you please not mention Jesus and I went to the Lord and I said Lord what am I going to do they want me to pray. They don't want me to mention Jesus. And I told the person on the phone, I said, well, you know, that is to whom I pray. And if I'm not going to pray to Jesus, there's not much point in me praying. Amen. And they said, well, you know, we want you to pray. Come, come anyway. So what am I going to do? And I told you, I said this, I think, last Sunday or sometime recently. I felt like going down there and saying, may the force be with you, <laughs> you know, because it, it just doesn't make sense. So you know what I did? Here's what I did. I went down there and I took my Bible with me. And when they it was my turn, I stood up and I laid my Bible on the podium and I just started reading. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be. And you know what happened? The whole room stood up and said it with me. Everybody. Everybody there. The room was packed. Everybody stood up and said it. Afterward, I thought, Lord, that went better than I thought. <laughs> you know? I didn't think everybody would stand up and say, no, I know what you're thinking. Well, a lot of them probably did it because they're Catholics. Yeah, probably. 
But the point is, I didn't just have a prayer. Everybody had a prayer. So, that's part of the reason they don't ask me to come do that <laughs> anymore. <laughs> you know? But uh, are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious, folks. So, uh, one fellow said, uh, the fellow who didn't like it, he said, well, that's not how you should have handled it. And he, he had his idea how I should have done it. Maybe, again, maybe he was right. But that's what happened. And Jesus said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. And we call it the Lord's Prayer. But really, he said, after this manner, pray ye. What he's saying is pray like this. This is an example of how to pray. If you want to really read the Lord's Prayer, read John chapter 17. That is the Lord's Prayer. John 17 is the Lord praying to his heavenly Father. And you know who he's praying for? And I'm not exaggerating. He's praying for you. You read that prayer, and you read it carefully, you'll find out he's praying for you. Now, I know what you're thinking. How could he have been praying for me 2,000 years ago? I wouldn't even be born yet. Did he know you were going to be born? Yes. Did he make reference to you in that prayer? Yes. You mean he called me by name? No, he didn't call you by name, but he made reference to you. And if we had time, I'd show you that, but we don't, so I'm going to move on. The Lord says, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. And what do you start with? Our Father. Our Father. Your Father, my Father, is also our Father. And he says, our Father, which art in heaven. We have fathers on earth, and we are told to honor our fathers on earth, but we are to pray to our Father, which is in heaven. That's very important to remember. And the next thing he says is, hallowed be thy name. We looked a while ago in Exodus 20, or I quoted from it, Exodus 20, where uh, the Lord said, uh, honor thy father and thy mother. Well, in that same passage, the Lord says this, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that holdeth his name in vain. What does it mean to take God's name in vain. Well, the word vanity or vain in this case means emptiness. Don't use God's name in an empty way. Uh, honest truth, a lot of people these days just don't ever want to say Jesus or Jesus Christ unless they're using it as a swear word. Then they have no problem with it. That's vain. But that's not the only way to use the Lord's name in vain. What well, he's saying, don't take God's name lightly. Don't take the Lord's name in an empty way. When you use God's name, use it with reverence. So our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed or holy is your name. That's why we opened the service this morning of our first congregation. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which wert and art and evermore shall be. Hallowed be thy name. And then it says, pray for the Father's kingdom to come. Well, the kingdom's right here and now. No, I'm sorry, friends, it isn't. The kingdom is coming, and we're supposed to pray for the kingdom to come. What do you mean the kingdom's not here? Aren't we living in the kingdom? No, we're not. We're living in the church age. The church age is going to come to an end. When the church age ends... There's going to come a period that we call the tribulation period. And after that seven-year period, then the Lord Jesus is going to descend and reign on earth from heaven. And then the kingdom begins. That's the kingdom age. We're not there yet. It's coming. And we're supposed to pray for it. Pray, thy kingdom come. Look at the next sentence in verse 10. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now understand this. This is so important. God's will is done in heaven. The prayer is not for God's will to be done in heaven. That's already happening. The prayer is for God's will to be done on earth. It's already happening in heaven. Pray for God's will to be done on earth. Well, why isn't God's will always done on earth? Because he gives you and I a free will. 
and we don't always submit our will to his will and do what he would have us to do. Why not? Because we're too busy doing what we want to do. The old saying when I was a young person, not a good old saying, just an old saying. If it feels good, do it. You think that through, carried out to its logical end, that's a pretty idiotic thing to say. If it feels good, do it. Well, what if it feels good for me to punch you in the nose? Should I do it? No, why not? Well, it won't feel good to me. Well, that's not the point, is it? If it feels good to me, I should do it, right? No. No, I shouldn't. See how stupid that is? I'm sorry, it just is. That was the philosophy of the generation I grew up in. Not a good one. So that's what the Lord is saying. Don't live by if it feels good. Do it. Pray for God's will to be done in heaven. Submit your will to his will and let him have his will here on earth. Then he says, give us this day our daily bread. I saw a cartoon the other day where a little boy said, why do we pray for our daily bread? Why don't we pray for our daily cookies? <laughs> well, I, I, I get his thinking there. I really do. But the truth of the matter is, what, why do we pray for our daily bread? For the food, the sustenance that we need each day so that we can survive. Now, I'm going to tell you this. You can live on just bread and water. I'm not saying that's the best diet in the world. I'm not saying it's the healthiest diet in the world, but you can survive on it if you have to. If you don't have to, count yourself blessed. But if you had to, you could survive on it. So what the prayer is here, give us our basic need every day. Now, your Heavenly Father is so gracious that he likely, he can, he will, and likely has and is giving you far more than just your basic needs. And I can illustrate that very quickly. The fact that you're sitting where you are right now shows that you have more than just your basic needs. What do you mean by that? You're sitting in a building, it's air conditioned, the lights are on, there's a sound system, you're sitting on padded pews, that's more than just your basic needs. Even if you walked in today, that's still more than just your basic needs. Count your blessings. But pray for your basic needs. And then in verse 12, he says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, that doesn't mean, Lord, forgive my debts so I don't have to pay my bills. That's not what it's talking about. Not what it's talking about at all. It means, and the Luke's version of it says, uh, Forgive us our trespasses, our sins. Because... We need to pray daily for the forgiveness of sin. Daniel prayed for the people of Israel, for the people of Judah more particularly, and he prayed for them. And it's a beautiful, beautiful prayer that we read. And as Daniel prays, you know what he does? He confesses his sins. Now let me help you with something there. Daniel is the only major character in the Old Testament. Now there's some lesser characters that, when I say lesser, they get fewer words, okay? But uh, Daniel's the only major character of which we're never told that he did anything wrong. Now, did Daniel ever do anything wrong? I'm sure he did, but we're not told about it. And yet, this fella who God chose not to tell us anything that he did wrong is confessing sins. That's why I'm sure he did. He's confessing his sin. And what the Lord is telling us is when we pray, Confess our sins and then forgive others as we have been forgiven. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. I found out by experience it is difficult to stay angry with a person when you're praying for that person. It's hard to stay angry with them when you're praying for them. Because there's somebody you're angry with. Why don't you try praying for that person? Maybe... Maybe they did whatever made you angry because something's wrong in their life. Does that make sense? And maybe you need to pray for them that that gets straightened out in their life. 
And then it says, lead us not into temptation. Now, you're going to read in another place in the Bible, it says God doesn't tempt people. Well, the word temptation here uh, is not saying that God is tempting you. It's saying don't let us go into temptation. But when we do, deliver us from evil. Temptation and sin are two different things. Everybody is tempted. James says that. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. Being tempted is one thing. Giving in to the temptation is another thing. And I'm not going to ask anybody to respond to this, but just think about it. Has there ever been a situation where you wanted to do something and you knew that thing wasn't right, but you really wanted to do it? That's temptation. Now, the test is what you do at that moment. Do you give in knowing it's the wrong thing to do and just do it anyway? Or do you stop and say, no, I, that's wrong. I can't do it. Well, how are you going to have the strength to do that? Because I'm going to tell you, sometimes your mind knows something is wrong. Your spirit knows something is wrong. And your body says, yeah, but I need that. And your body, your physical need or your physical desire is stronger than your mental will to resist. And sometimes it's stronger than your own spiritual will to, exist, to resist. So what are you going to do? Well, he tells you what to do. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You're going to pray about it. Lord, help me. I know it's wrong, but I am sore tempted. I need your help. I need your help. And folks, we do. We need. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need God's help to help us to resist temptation. Same writer that says every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. The same writer says resist the devil and he will flee from you. What's the key to him fleeing from you? Resist. How are you going to resist? You're going to go to God in prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Whose kingdom is it we're talking about? It's the kingdom of the Lord. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's his kingdom. It's his power. We live by his power. We're saved by his power. Paul writes in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that what? Believe it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why does he say it that way? Because that's how it happened. The gospel came to the Jew first and then to the Greek and then to all the rest of us. The Greek there generic term meaning all the rest of us but the fact of the matter is it came to the Jew first I was talking with a man oh must be close to two years ago and he said uh, he said to me I mentioned the Bible he said the Bible is just written by men I said well that's true the Bible was written by men but they were Israeli men and you need to understand that. And God has used the people of Israel to bless the world. You know why? Because he promised Abraham he would do that. Genesis chapter 12. And God has blessed, I explained this man, God has blessed the world in that. Through the people of Israel, we have his word. And through the people of Israel, we have the Savior. I'm standing at the door one Sunday morning many years ago and a lady uh, stopped at the door and spoke to me as people do and I, I not only don't mind that I welcome it but she said to me said I went to another church and she said you know what that preacher said now how would I know what that preacher said I have no idea wasn't there no I know I said no ma'am I, I don't know what the preacher said <clears throat> and she said he said that Jesus is a Jew. And I said, well, guess what? <laughs> See what? I said, he's right. He's right. Of the tribe of Judah. Okay. You can't get around that, folks. I don't want to. But if you wanted to, you can't get around it. And that's not by accident or coincidence. That was God's design. And God through the people of Israel gave us his word through the people of Israel he gave us the savior through the people of Israel he has blessed the whole world 
There's no question about that. And so thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. All glory belongs to God. If you and I have done anything, if we have accomplished anything, we need to give glory to God. And for how long? Forever. Amen. Amen. I was a first-year student studying for ministry, and I was in an Old Testament survey class. And somebody had asked me, I'd been witnessing to a man at work, and he said, what, is, what does the word amen mean? I said, I don't know. It's just something you say at the end of a prayer. I'd, I'd only been a Christian a little over a year at that point. And uh, he, he said, you know, but what does it mean? I didn't know. So after Old Testament survey <clears throat> uh, class one day, I went to my professor, and I, I said to him, what, did, what does amen mean? And, and he had said something during class, and, and some brother had amen it. He said, oh, well, I said this, and he was agreeing. I said, no, sir, that's not what I'm asking you. What does the word amen mean? He said, oh, it says, means be it ever so. And that is what it means, be it ever so. So that's what it means, be it ever so. That's why you say amen at the end of your prayer. Now, right before the passage we started, in Matthew 6, 1, the last verse of chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus says this, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And you know that we're not perfect. But we are supposed to be growing to be as much like the Lord as we can be. And one day, when we're at home with your Father and my Father and our Father, then we'll finally be perfect. Because the promise is we shall be like him when we see him as he is. But in the meantime, we're supposed to grow, and spiritual growth is growing to be like him. So our family is a picture, but it is not a perfect picture. We should be growing to be more like the perfect picture. And our family is a picture, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's been said by wiser men than I am that the Father obviously represents God the Father. Fathers on earth are not God. We're not saying that. But they represent the role of our Heavenly Father. The Son or the children represent the role of the Son. And the mother in the home represents the Holy Spirit. Now, are you saying the Holy Spirit is female? I did not say that. I'm telling you about the roles God has given us. None of us measure up to the perfection of that. But what we have the responsibility to do is to present to our children and to others that picture so that they will understand their true Heavenly Father. Now, Far too often, we mar the picture. We mess it up. Isn't it wonderful that our Heavenly Father forgives? And He can forgive because our sins were paid for at the cross. And He's provided for our shortcomings. He has provided for our sins. And as we come to Him and confess our sins, as he told us in verse 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He forgives based on the fact, as I've said, that our sins were paid for. I'll share this story again. I've shared it here many times. A lady came to me one day, and I, I knew her. She, she lived nearby here. She was not a member of our church. She was actually a member of another church here in town. And she came to me for counsel, and I, I wondered why she came to me, why she didn't go to her pastor for counsel. But as she told her story, I understood why she came to me and not to her pastor, and I won't go into it, but th there was valid reason. But she had genuinely been wrong. I don't mean somebody had snubbed her or somebody had uh, said something out of the way. I mean, she had genuinely been wronged 
not by one person, but by a number of people. And her question for me was this. When these people have wronged me in the way they have, I am a Christian, and the Lord tells me to forgive them. How can I forgive them? And if I told you what the way she had been wrong, you might have thought like I thought, because when she said that, I didn't say it out loud, but I was thinking inside, yeah, how can you? How can you forgive that? It was so wrong. But I didn't say that. You imagine how discouraging it would be. You came to pastoral council, and he says, yeah, there's no hope. That, 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 that doesn't work out very well. So what did you do? I did what we ought to do. I prayed about it. Right there, right there on the spot, yeah. I said, Lord, what am I going to tell? And here's what the Lord gave me. Ephesians 4.32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Here's the key. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. How does God forgive your sins? For Christ's sake. When I come to the Lord and I confess my sins, you know what he says? He says, that was paid for at the cross. Forgiven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. How can we forgive those who have wronged us? See it from God's point of view. That was paid for at the cross. And I'm going to tell you, that's the only way that works. You can try making excuses. You can try explaining it away. And it may make you feel better for a while, but you'll never really forgive that person. It'll stay with you until you account that it was paid for at the cross. Because that's how your father and my father and our father forgives us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what an honor and a privilege it is to call you our Heavenly Father. Lord, we need you. We need you in every aspect of our life, but we need you as our Heavenly Father. And right now, it is my prayer that everyone in this room and everyone in the sound of my voice would turn their heart to you as their heavenly father. Perhaps not understanding all about it, perhaps not knowing all about it, but just trusting in you as our heavenly father. Now, Lord, we've seen in your word that our sins separate us from you, but we've also seen that you love us and Jesus loves us and gave himself for us. And if we trust that our sins were paid for at the cross, we can trust that you will forgive us because you've given your word to do so. And we can rest in that forgiveness. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe you've already trusted the Lord as your Savior. And if you have, praise God and thank God. Maybe you say, preacher, I did that. And I know I did. I know I got saved, but I've sinned since then. And I do share with you that is not unusual. And it's certainly found in Scripture. So the Bible says, confess your sins. And he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Because it was paid for at the cross. Now maybe somebody's listening today either in the room or electronically and they have to say, well, I, what you're saying to me sounds good, but I'm not sure I understand it. We'd be happy to help you with that. That's one of the primary reasons that this church and this ministry exists is to help people with that very question. But right now, right where you are, whether you're here in this room or whether you're listening you can call upon the Lord and you can trust him as best you know how in your heart. You don't know all about it. You don't understand all about it. But as best you know how, you trust him right now. 
When you call on me, you say, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that though I'm a sinner, you still love me. I believe that you paid for my sins at the cross. And I believe that you're alive today and I trust you to forgive me, to save my soul, and to give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, maybe you prayed that prayer, maybe you didn't. But the Savior is waiting to en enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? That old hymn says that, and it's right. Father, work in hearts and lives today. Help us to respond to you, our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.